Good evening and welcome to A Place Call Through. We're broadcasting live from WYTV7 Christian Broadcasters Network, where we share stories for real people who share those stories of inspiration. We, with a mission to empower you, to encourage and to inspire as we do so globally. And it's only done by your charitable donations. We go globally every day, trying to encourage and empower people so I want you to know that your contributions have helped make those differences for us. So I wanna know, can I still count on you to help us make another charitable donation, if you will? And if you haven't, take this time out to go to WYTV7.org and make that charitable donation to help us continue with our mission of hope. I am your host, Patricia Way Goings, and today I welcome as my guest, Dr. Betsy Greenleaf to A Place Called Through. Welcome, Dr. Greenleaf, to A Place Called Through. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here today. I'm looking forward to speaking with you. Likewise. Well, we're going to have an awesome next 30 minutes as we're going to tell your story and let you share your testimony of where you've been and how you've got through. And, you know, a lot of people are still going through so many things, especially now with COVID, you know, being still on the increase. But, you know, we I read your story and you have such a testimony there. So we want to talk to you. Let's kind of like bring it in, you know, going through elementary school, I would say, and going to junior high school. You know, your guidance counselors ask you, well, what do you want to be? What do you want to do? And, you know, as we're little kids, you know, oh, I want to be a nurse. I, you know, we want to be a lawyer. We, you know, we want to be everything that we can possibly think of until reality really sets in. So, you know, doing your early childhood, what was your dream? What did you want to do? You know, it's funny because I talk about this all the time. I'm like, I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> and I think that's one of the great <laughs> things is that we we keep, ch- ch- you know, changing. Um, you know, actually, one of the stories is going back way, way back to like kindergarten. I wanted to be a cheerleader and I wanted to be a Dallas Cowboy cheerleader <laughs> because they seemed so super cool. And, uh, and you know, and unfortunately, I think that's my first lesson that, you know, wasn't enough to wish and want for something that you actually had to work hard because what in kindergarten, I went for my cheerleading tryouts and I was, I just thought I would get it because I wanted it. I wished for it to happen and to get that rejection at the age of five. And I was like, wait a minute, what's going on? This isn't how the world works. And it was my first lesson into, you know what, not only do you have to work hard, like not only do you have to want something, you got to really work hard to get it. And it's kind of carried over into a lot of aspects of life. I see that all the time as a doctor is people are like, I want to get better. You know, I'm hoping to get better. Well, it's not just the doctor that has to be doing that. It's you have to reach inside and go, all right, what can I do to make myself better? And so I think it's hard work on everybody's, you know, on everybody's plate to get, you know, get you to where you want to be. So, and I agree with you because you have to have that will, that determination, and plus that motivation to pick yourself from, from where you are. And, you know, in going through, Sometimes, yes, we are laying down and we're sitting still trying to figure out what is our next step, you know. I think that, you know, as we talk further on with you, your test and your testimony has been your journey. It's your life journey. And so, you know, we all are going to be tested, but it's the outcome of that test that takes you to that further journey. And we all have aspirations. Hopefully we all do. Um, But it's sometimes it's hard to achieve those things. And as you stated, yes, that motivation has to be there, that determination. But then one thing I found out in life is commitment. You've yeah. got to be committed to yourself and your purpose. You know, um, if you're not committed, well, you know, you're kind of like not going to level out on what you want to do. So you've passed that cheerleading stage and you've gone on now <laughs> and you said, oh, well, it didn't work. So now we're going to look into doing something else. And again, Go back to, you know, your guidance counselors, because they sometimes watch, you know, students and they see those aspirations. And sometimes your teacher even says, well, she may want to be a writer. She's good at this. Or, you know, this one may want to be a singer. So kind of talk to us, what was going on in school? What did your teachers and your guidance counselors and even your parents think about where you wanted to go or what you should do with yourself? I definitely had a very strong interest in the sciences. And so I, I, there was always this, I wanted to help people. And 
and the interest in the science and it kind of went back and forth. Like, did I want to become a veterinarian? Do, do, do I want to become a doctor? My mom used to make fun of me because she said that either I was either going to be a surgeon or I was going to be a sculptor because she said I would sit there with my dinner plate and I would sit there and like cut my food up like so incredibly perfectly. I would I would cut it into different shapes, especially when you got the that cranberry jelly that used to come, mm-hmm. you know, like with and that solid, um, you know, jelly type form. I would sit there and sculpt it into different shapes. So, you know, looking back, she's like, I always knew you were going to be a surgeon. But at the time she was like, well, you're either going to be a surgeon or you're going to be a sculptor. I'm not quite sure which one. <laughs> so and I love cranberry sauce too, but I don't yeah. I don't cut it up. Like to cut now it you're not gonna look directly. at it again. You're gonna want to cut it into different like shapes and designs. So. <laughs> it just seemed like it'll move around, so I wouldn't be cutting into. <laughs> um, but okay, so now okay, graduation time comes, and I'm sure by now you're like, okay, I've got to decide where I want to go, and this is where we get into where your test becomes your testimony. Oh, so sure. you you you've gone through so much, you know indecisiveness and trying to just kind of say, okay, who am I and the path that I need to go? And so now graduation time has come out of high school and it's time to move on, you know, to gain more education. So what have you decided at that point that you wanted to do? So, you know, once again, I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. So I kind of put it in God's hands because I was like, you know, I have a couple interests. I was really interested in genetics. So I applied for PhD in genetics and then I couldn't still couldn't decide between human medicine and veterinary medicine. So I applied to both and I ended up getting into medical school. And so then that was it. I went to medical school and I was like, this is great, you know. I'm going to make a difference in the world. I'm going to help people. This is going to be wonderful. And then, you know, as I went through, um, I think the biggest thing was then you finish medical school and you're all like, yay, rah, rah, going to make a difference in the world. And then you start hitting your, your fellowship or your residency training. And interesting enough, once again, I got to that point and couldn't decide, like, do I want to do general surgery? Do I want to do obstetrics and gynecology. I kind of had an interest in both. I applied to both. I got into general surgery first. And I think the, the biggest problem was that was where the first, the first time in my life that I really remember hitting a stage where sexism was thrown in my face. And so this is like the 19... 19- 90s early 2000s and I remember my dad telling me like years ago um that this this concept of this glass ceiling and that as a woman I'm gonna have to deal with this and that I'm not gonna be able to go up higher because of you know this and then that it's yes it's not fair and that you know, men to tend to make more, but I didn't believe it. I was like, come on, these are modern times. Like that's something that happened years ago. That doesn't happen now. And, um, but then that I, it was shown to me that it still happens. Um, and so I remember the first time I walked into an operating room, I had one of the male surgeons looked over at me and he was like, oh, you, what am I going to talk to you about? And so there was this like, okay, they couldn't relate to me. They didn't know how to deal with me. I would sit and I would go home and study, instead of studying surgery and surgical techniques, I would study the sports pages because I wanted to have something that I could come and be relatable and be able to talk to them about. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that kind of seems like a little waste of my my time. I should have been studying more surgery. I I was trying to do both. And then I was trying to, you know, fit in with the boys And, um, you know, it it was definitely challenging, but I thought like, okay, this is just, you know, this is part of that hazing process that you go through, through medical training. I thought once I get out into the real world, that it's going to be a completely different story. And, um, so I, I, I ended up going halfway through general surgery and actually realized that general surgery was not where I wanted to be. Um, not nothing against general surgeons. I love them. They're very good at what they do, but I wanted more of a relationship with my patients. Uh, mm-hmm. I find that the general surgeons were really, really good, tend to be very 
mechanical, like almost like, like body mechanics, like get in, get out, do their thing. Like I was the one who would go around the hospital and try to talk to the patients, be like, so how are you feeling now that you don't have your appendix? You know? So, so really I found that my skills were better served in the world of gynecology because I could have that relationship with my patients and still do the surgery. Um, I'm going to go back because you mentioned something, um, you know, really interesting, um, being a female and being in the medical, um, you know, profession, the relationship with the male doctors, um, you know, they didn't appear to seem to receive you too well when you got there. Um, and so I'm sure that had to have great impact on, you know, where you were at this time. What kind of relationship was it working with them? Um, you know, because it sounds like it was kind of cruel at one point. You know, it was interesting. And it's funny because, you know, there was no Me Too movement back then. You know, you just kind of learn to deal with the comments and kind of laugh them off. And now I, I skip ahead to like today's times that I think about, you know, some of the things that were said to me, there's no way anybody could get away with them, you know, nowadays, you know, uh, you know, coming, walking into the, the, um, the operating room and being told like, oh, hey, you like, turn around, let me get a good check, you know, or even being at an operating room table and having a surgeon kind of like pull up his like elbow and rub it on my breast while he's doing surgery and being like, ha ha, you know, like this is a joke. And, you know, at that time you just were like, all right, I don't, I don't know. It was like a, it was like a different time. We just kind of just like, all right, I'm going to laugh it off and just still try to fit in. So uh, you know, it's definitely something that today's day and age, you nobody would ever get away with something like that. So, oh, definitely. So times have changed so much. Well, listen, Dr. Bessie, stay with us. Um, to our viewers and our listeners, we're going to go to a commercial break, and after that, we'll return back to a place call through. And then we're broadcasting from WYTV Seven Christian Broadcasters Network. We'll return. My test, my testimony, my journey. Dr. Bessie Greenleaf here on A Place Call Through. We'll be right back. 80% of women will develop a pelvic health condition at some point in their lives. There is relief. There is hope. The Pelvic Floor Store, your resource for personal health. A Place Call Through, where we're sharing today a testimony turning um, to a journey, a lifetime journey, medical profession. Um, we're here with Dr. Bessie Greenleaf, and she's telling us you know, growing up, we all have dreams and we want to do this and we want to do that. And of course, like everyone else, she's had a dream. She wanted to be this, you know, she want to go to the top of the world. She wants to travel, have a family of her own. But life took her into a medical field. So we want to continue with Dr. Bessie talking about her journey. Uh, you know, as a female doctor, now female doctor, it has not always been easy for her you know, being accepted just as a female in the medical profession back in the day, it has been most challenging for her. But again, in this going through, in this place called through, it is where the journey actually happened, where it is now taken her. So we want to talk to her some more about, you know, this path that she had to go through to get to where she is now. Dr. Bessie Greenleaf, welcome back to A Place Called Through. We want to continue talking to you. You know, we understand that there were some hurdles that you had to come over, but now you're thriving as a doctor after all of that that you've been through. Um, and we're just so thankful that things have turned around for you. So bring us in now, you know, to where you are medically in your practice. What is it that you finally got your hands on that you're, that you're enjoying doing? You know, it's funny because like I said, there were a lot of challenges and especially even when I'm entered the actual work field and that I was surprised that the sexism continued. And I was told that things like women don't have the eye hand coordination to do surgery and um, we should be staying, we're ruining medicine because we want to have a family and a career. So that, you know, that takes a big toll on your self-confidence and um, you know, interesting enough, you know, I kept fighting it and fighting it. And then the, unfortunately or fortunately um i had a car accident in 2017 
what actually affected my neck and my hand. And I actually lost the ability to perform surgery that I had fought so many years through all of this to get to. And it's one of those things where I could have just crawled in a hole and been like, oh, woe well, is me. My life is over. I'm not doing the things that I fought for. Um, but that's, you know, not my personality. And I was like, you know, I've been told, you, you just retire, just retire, just, you know, be happy with what you did and what you've accomplished. And I was like, no, that's, that's not it because there's so many more people that I need to help in the world. And I want to be able to spread information, especially on women's health. And so um, I did actually have neck surgery and took two years off of working. And now where I'm at is I'm in the process of um, just spreading the world word about women's health and pelvic health in particular. Um, I have a couple of different things that, in, that are that are going on. I'm writing a book called The Happy Vagina Rally. Oh no, that's that's actually my summit that's going to be coming out later this year called The Happy Vagina Rally. Be, uh, that's going to address women with perimenopausal and menopausal issues because women don't talk about menopause. And so it's really to try to open up the conversation and, and get people understanding because we don't, we don't in general in, in our American culture, talk about pelvic health. It's kind of like we ignore that area between our belly button and the top of our thighs. Like it doesn't exist. We're going to like put our fingers in our ears and be like, no, 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 I don't know anything. And maybe it'll just go away. But 80% of women will have a pelvic health problem at some point in their life. And if we can't open up the conversation and start talking about this, then people are just going to keep continuing to suffer. So I found that my mission is let's get the conversation out. Let's start using the proper terminology for our body parts and not be squeamish and scared to mention these things because it's happening to everyone. You know, people think like I, all the time as a doctor, I would say patients would come to my office and they think that this, I'm the only one that this is happening to. And I'm like, no, you're, you know, you're not like 80% of women have these issues. So, um, so, I, oh, and so I'm writing a book called The Happy Vagina Diet. And so it's to connect our gut health and the things that we're eating and how it affects the rest of our body and in women, how it can affect the pelvic health from anything from bladder infections to vaginitis to, to other, to other uh, pelvic pain conditions. Um, so I'm hoping to also come out with a course that people can take online because I realize, even though I am seeing patients in my area, that there's so much that I have to, to share that I don't want to just, you know, I need to get it out there in, in where everybody can have access to it. So we're in the process of actually developing a course. So, because, you know, even women, they, I hear all the time that they feel rushed, they go to their doctors and it's not their doctor's fault. It's, it's unfortunately the insurance systems we work in, they don't have the time to spend with, with their patients. So patients aren't getting the answers they need. So this the courses will be developed to actually where somebody, you know, can just go online, take a little course, get the answers they need, and then be able to figure out where, what, what the next step they need to do. So hopefully, like, you know, the plan is that I'm going to be guiding them through with, with this in, in many different ways. So, um, and that's amazing because, you know, as a female, a lot of times, you know, we don't reveal a lot of things about ourselves because it's a male person that, you know, is our doctor. So we kind of keep those things, you know, confidential. Um, and, and it's not a good thing because they're there to help us. But we just, I think by human nature, our flesh says, no, I'm just not going to tell. Um, I've actually, I didn't experience, my mother went through a similar situation before she passed. She actually had breast cancer. And I mean, she, she died of breast cancer, had to metastasize, and she went to the doctor that day. She actually used to work for this doctor. And something, I guess the Holy Spirit just turned her back around, and she finally went back in and told him something was wrong. And immediately he put her in the hospital, and he called me. He said, in 35 years, I have never seen anything such. So we do tend to hide, you know, things. Unfortunately, it was too late. She couldn't, they couldn't really help her. But, you know... Uh, we're ever thankful that, you know, you're going through with writing books now because you overcame some of these obstacles that, you know, not wanting to maybe share some of the things that, you know, you experienced the little hunches and the nudges and, you know, the little smirks and, 
I think that you had mentioned too, going into the cafeteria and you ended up in the men's, you know, lounge, I guess, lunchroom, not knowing that. And, you know, and the reactions from the men, rather than standing up and saying, you know, something kind to you, they all kind of just give you those little smirks. So, you know, we applaud you for where you are in sharing what you have um, with your journey. Now, we, you know, I knew that you were in a car accident as well. So during that time, you know, because, you know, you had the surgery, it affected your hand, which, of course, you need for surgery, and your neck. That was, I'm sure, a really hard place for you to be. And we're kind of like almost at the end. So, But I want to go back to that of your time of meditation and time to bring you to where you are now and possibly where you're going in the future. Yeah, I, I spent a lot of time because, because, you know, I'm not saying it's all it was all roses. It's tough. I mean, I, I was the first board certified female or I am the first board certified female urogynecologist in the country, you know, worked very hard to have a surgical career and then to be able not to be able to perform surgery anymore did kind of take a little bit away of my identity. It was tough. You know, it was definitely tough to be like, all right, well, I trained so hard and so long and now what? And so I, I did, I spent a lot of time, I spent a lot of time praying, I spent a lot of time meditating, journaling, because I know the answers are out there and that we don't, may not always have them right that minute, but if we ask and put it out there, the answers will come to us. So, um, and I found that it, it was interesting because the more I started to ask, whether it was God, the universe, um, you know, friends and family, the more I, I started putting it out there, the more answers I was getting. And I was just absolutely, you know, amazed. It would be like the right person would show up in my life like on that day. And I like, you know, couldn't explain all these little things that were starting to happen. And I think that's one of the things that is we get so caught up in our lives and what's happening around us that we become blind to all the little miracles that happen every single day and the little messages that happen. So I've really tried myself to be like, okay, I'm going to open up and be more mindful of these things because the answers are there. We just got to see them. And, you know, there are some days where it's Tough. You know, there are days where I'm like, oh, this isn't working. This isn't going right. What am I going to do? And then I got to, I have to remind myself constantly, like, stop, take a deep breath. You know, like it will all work out. Of course, I would love, like many people, I would love all the answers yesterday. But, you know, oh. that's why we have each day to kind of grow and become better and better. So that's been really the, the kind of the direction that I've taken. So, um, and it's my mom, my, you know, I have, I have a great, uh, I have a great relationship with my mom and my mom, she'll text me scripture and she'll like, she'll find stuff and she'll be like, oh my goodness, I just read this today. And it'll be completely appropriate for, for, um, you know, what I'm going through that day. So it's been, that's been really great. So where do you see yourself going from here now? Oh man, I have so much. <laughs> so yeah, partially, um, well, I have, a, I have a show about wellness here on WYTV7. I also have a podcast called Some of Your Parts where we talk about women's wellness, but basically just building this brand on, on women's health and getting it out more in, into the mainstream so that people can talk about things without being embarrassed because if we can talk, we can heal. So, you know, opening up the conversation, um, I have a, a store called the pelvic floor store, which is I've, I found that my patients had a hard time finding reliable pelvic health products and got very confused with what was on the market. So I try to compile all the ones that I liked into one site. And I'm in the process of developing my own products that we'll be putting on that site. So and then really the ultimate goal for me would be eventually to create a nonprofit that will do research um, in women's health issues. So, you know, trying to build up, I guess, really the funding to get to that point where I could have something like that would be, would be the ultimate goal. So, um, but, you know, I basically want to become your guide to women's health and pelvic health and be able to help direct people where, so where they can become the heroes in their own life story and where they don't have to worry about their, their issues, but they can heal and kind of just live their life. So 
Well, we we definitely want to give a shout out to you know um, the pelvic floor store um, for I mean really sponsoring and working with WYTV seven. We truly truly really appreciate that. Um, you know, I have just one thing um, before I end this with you is how would you encourage you know uh, another female or other females that want to get into the medical profession or may be experiencing some of the same things that you already went through. We are going to have to wrap it up real quick, but if you could just give us that last little bit of encouragement, um, you know, because again, your story is my test turned to my testimony and now your journey. So if you would, um, Dr. Greenleaf, please share that with us. Sure. I think no matter what you want to do, whether you want to go into medicine or, or something else, just to follow your heart. And honestly, if you're experienced, you know, today's a different age. We don't see as many issues with sexism, hopefully. But if you are experienced that, talk to somebody who understands, you know, talk to a fellow fellow colleague, another, another female that may be going through the same thing, because that's the only way anybody's going to get through anything is when we band together and, um, and just have open conversation for healing. So, and I think that's the best way that we're going to all be able to grow and, and become better people and be able to be there for, for others. So, so Dr. Bessie, we thank you for being our guest today, but you know, for anyone that wants to reach out to you, can you give them your website? your podcast information, your books, and of course, information to go to the store. So if you would share that with us now, please. Sure. You can follow me on social media. I'm on Instagram at Dr. Betsy Greenleaf. Um, also, my, my practice website is greenleafbewell.com, and that's Greenleaf Health and Wellness. There's the pelvicfloorstore.com is the, our, the pelvic floor. And there's also my personal website, which is drbetsygreenleaf.com. So you can reach out to me through any of those. And yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to working with you or, or helping you along your way. Well, we certainly thank you. And I appreciate you for sharing that information with us. We're just about out of time. But again, I want to really thank you for being my guest here today on A Place Call Through. It's been truly an honor and a pleasure to finally get to meet you. Hope that you come back another day and share some more valuable information with us as we continue the journey together on a place called through here at WYTV7, Christian Broadcasters Network, where I am your host, Patricia Wade Goings, and I am also the author of Will Power, The Call to Rise Above. If you'd like to be my guest, please reach me in area code of 843-608-9744 by email at pgoingswp at gmail.com. You may also follow me and for additional information about my broadcast, you may find me at A Place Call Through on Facebook, A Place Call Through at Willpower, The Call to Rise Above. Again, remember those charitable donations help us with our mission of hope. Please do so by going to wytv7.org. Again, we thank you, Dr. Greenlee, for being our guest today. It's been an honor and truly a pleasure. May God continue to bless you in all that you do. God bless you and thank you. Thank you so much, Pat. It's been wonderful being here and, and I'm so happy to have been given the chance to talk to you. And we hope we'll get a chance to talk again soon.